it's Lee from Colouring Queen. Oh, I hope you're all doing well today. I'm still colouring in Mandolin by Maria Troll and today I'm going to use my Prismacolors again. This picture is for my Things That Fly in July colour along. So I hope you've all been having a great day. We're on the end of the weekend here in Australia. It's Sunday night and uh, yeah, I'm trying to relax and get all the things done that I need to get done for the week. We've had a pretty busy week, lots of gardening. We're still putting in all of these uh, little Moses in the cradle plants that we got off Facebook Marketplace. I love that place. So good. And uh, we're every day we're just planting a few more in the garden to sort of give it that little final touch that it needs and other than that uh, what else have we been doing David's been working uh, up the coast for most of the week so he's been getting up at 3 30 a.m in the morning and driving you know an hour and a half two hours to work and then two hours back so he has been really really tired and when he comes home overnight, he's, you know, pretty well too tired to do anything. And what have I been doing? Oh, I can't really remember. All the days just go into one for me. Um, <laughs> I've been doing uh, some more research for my crime channel. So if you haven't checked that out, you know, make sure you go and do that. Had a few technical difficulties and whatnot, still trying to get everything sorted out, but hopefully that will resolve itself soon. Uh, what else have we been doing? Uh, we went uh, yesterday down to one of the suburbs that we really like. We'd really like to move there, but the prices are just a little bit, uh, you know, not within the budget at the moment, but maybe one day. And we took Buddy down there and yesterday he had such a good time. We went and walked along the foreshore and we went and walked along the beach and they had this huge pier that was 350 metres long. And Buddy walked all the way up and down and because with his new medication he's been very slow with his walks and... You know, sometimes he tires out walking around the block and being a Border Collie, they're pretty active dogs usually and so it's really sad to see that he sometimes is just struggling to make it home from around the block. But yesterday he was just so stimulated. He was loving it. And on the pier, all these people were fishing and it was a beautiful day. The weather was gorgeous and... He had a great time walking along the pier and he was so stimulated uh, seeing all the people fish and, you know, people petting him, of course, you know. And then we walked along the foreshore and I was really surprised uh, that he was still feeling active and able to make the walk. And so we walked along the foreshore and... He met lots and lots of little dogs. He sort of fell in love a little bit with this little blondie. Oh, she was cute. She was running around and she kept kneeling and looking at him and he was smiling. And it was just so good to see because this medication really knocks him around. And he was like, you know, his old self, like when we first got him and just so active and playful and... It was just really, really lovely to see. So he told us both that he wants to move there and we've got to make it happen. So, you know, I'm I'm really concentrating hard that I can make it happen to make him happy, you know, <laughs> so that he can move there and go there every day. We liked it so much that uh, we went again today. And uh, this time we walked around where all the little boats are birthed and whatnot and we looked at the little boats and all the people fishing off the rocks and fishing off the pier and walked around all these beautiful uh, tree-lined streets and I was amazed again at how much he walked and he also seen lots and lots of other dogs and so he was just really stimulated by the geographic area and 
Like even when I take him to the park and stuff here and he sees all the kids, which excites him so much, he hasn't been as stimulated and he always walks home, you know, with his head down and sort of just really, really slowly. And sometimes I have to just stop and, you know, let him rest. But yesterday and today he was full of beans and just having a great time. And yeah, that's the best. So after I finish this video, I'm going to make some chicken soup with uh, spinach and feta tortellini pasta in it. Now that might sound weird and it also has lemon in it and asparagus. It might sound weird, but it is really beautiful. And then after that, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that the diabetes gods will let me have some blueberry cheesecake and, <laughs> you know, so I can have a little bit of indulgence. I've been good. I just need a little bit of a sugar here, you know. So hopefully, um, hopefully I can be on my good behavior and get a little bit of cheesecake afterwards, after the soup. So yeah, full night still planned of things to do and cleaning and putting things away. I don't know how such a small house with only two people and two pets gets so messy, but it certainly does. <laughs> but anyway, so today was meant to be a crime story and I actually did half of the research and then the story took a twist um, from some recent information that's come out in the last couple of years. So rather than uh, putting it on this channel because it took a twist, you know, in not a good way, uh, I'm putting it on my crime channel. So I had to quickly rethink uh, to see what story I would tell today. So this one is a story, not a crime story. Next week, I'll be back with a crime story, I promise. But this one took an unexpected twist when I was doing some final fact checking. And so I can't can't put it on this channel because I don't do that sort of stuff on this channel. So it's going on the other one. So today's story expands on some stories that I've told previously. So the snail in the bottle story and Dr. Grant's underpants. And I think I said in both of those, that especially with the snail in the bottle story, the, the judge that decided that case, he would probably be turning in his grave if he seen how that case or that story, if you want to call it, has expanded over the years. So today's story is an example of how that's expanded. Now, to be honest, I think this expansion was actually a good thing, but as always, I would love to know what you think. So we're going back to the 1950s to England. Back then, there was an advertising agency called Headley Byrne and like all advertising agencies, they get approached by clients and they were approached this time by a client called Easy Power. I think they made washing machines and other appliances like that. I could be wrong. And anyway, Easy Power wanted to spend up big on advertising. They really wanted to go the Coca-Cola way of really getting into the advertising market and letting people know about their fabulous product. And they actually wanted to spend eight to ten, eight to nine thousand pounds on advertising. Now this was in the 1950s and that is a lot of money back then, especially for advertising. So they'd get radio spots, which the radio was huge back in those days. I don't know if it would be TV spots as well, but definitely radio and probably print media ads in magazines and things like that, newspapers. They were all extremely popular back in the 50s. If you like looking at vintage advertising stuff like I do, you will um, be familiar with those sorts of ads. So Headley Burn, because this was such a huge amount of money, they were a little bit cautious and they wanted to make sure that they'd actually be paid for this work. So they asked their bank, the National Provincial Bank Limited, 
to contact the bank for Easy Power. Now, Easy Power's bank uh, was a merchant bank and they were called Heller and Partners. So the National Provincial Bank, on behalf of Headley Byrne, contacted the bank for Easy Power, Heller and Partners, and they just did that by phone. Oh, and can you hear Buddy snoring in the background? He just did, I call it a foghorn leghorn, he makes out these funny noises. Anyway, sorry about that, but Buddy says hello. Um, (laughs) back to the story. So they contacted the bank by telephone on the 8th of August, 1958. And they asked them whether Easy Power were in a financial position uh, and their credit worthiness to cover the advertisement costs. Now, the bank officer that they spoke to at Heller and Partners said that the company was a respectable company who had recently opened an account with them and they were a subsidiary of Pina Industries Limited, which was a corporation that was actually in liquidation. But the subsidiary company, Easy Power, was trading successfully. Now, each officer of the bank took a note of that telephone covers. So we'll try that again, shall we? So each officer of the bank took a note of the telephone conversation contemporaneously, which is just a fancy pants way of saying at the same time. But contemporaneous notes are super important. They're given a lot of weight in courts because of their importance. Anyway, uh, later on, when things got rough between these two, both of them agreed that these notes were correct on what happened. So a few months later on, Easy Power approached Headley Burn again and they wanted to increase their advertising spend. Now remember they started off with uh, eight to nine thousand pounds, but this time they wanted to go hard. They wanted to spend a hundred thousand pounds, which is an enormous amount of money in the 1950s. So again, Headley Byrne checked with Heller and Partners by writing to them this time. And they wrote to them on the 7th of November. And they said, asked them basically the same sort of questions again, whether Easy Power could cover such a large financial outlay. And Heller and Partners responded in the same way. They sent them a letter and they didn't charge them a fee or anything for doing this. They sent them a letter on the 11th of November 1958 and at the top of the letter it said for your private use and without responsibility of this bank or its officials. Now the content of that letter basically said that Easy Power was a respectable constituted constituted company considered good for its business engagements and I'm really tongue-tied today I'm sorry about that and the letter went on to say that your figures are larger than we're accustomed to see. Now relying on the contents of this letter that it basically said they're good for its business engagements Headley Byrne went ahead and purchased advertising space on behalf of Easy Power. So, you know, like advertising slots where their ad might run at 7am or a really good time. Um, Even back in the 1950s, you still had to purchase those advertising slots just like you do now for any sort of media coverage. And obviously some times and days are better. Uh, because they attract the right audience for the particular product or they get more people viewing or tuning in uh, at that time. So anyway, Easy Power, of course, we knew how this story was going to go, didn't we? They went broke and Headley Byrne were left about £17,000 short of the money that they were owed. So on the $100,000 spend... They got paid like £83,000, but this was a significant amount of money to lose. And I think I've seen one estimate that nowadays that this would be about $400,000. So you can see that it's a really a lot of, of money, a lot of money to 
lose. And bear in mind that they've done the work and they did all the right things. They checked to see if they were good for payment, etc. So Hedley Byrne wondered what on earth they could do to recover this huge amount that they were short on. And the first thought would be to sue uh, Easy Power for the shortfall, which is the normal thing with debt collections. And again, that's Buddy in the background saying hello. But of course, they couldn't sue Easy Power because the cupboard was bare. I mean, you could sue them, but you're just not going to get anything. You know, you can't get blood out of a stone. So there was nothing there. So they decided that they would sue Heller and Partners. Now, they couldn't sue under contract law because they actually didn't have a contract. Heller and Partners provided that letter to them free of charge. There was no consideration, which is sort of essential in contract law. And there there wasn't any sort of contractual relationship there. So the only way that they could sue Heller and Partners would be under tort law and specifically under negligence, which if you've read the previous stories or listened to the previous stories, I really can't talk today. Seriously, I'm getting everything all muddled up with words. Um, But in those previous cases, we talked about negligence in Dr. Grant's underpants and in the snail in the bottle. So Hedley Byrne based their claim on the bank's statement, which was, they alleged, negligently given and was misleading. And that statement was those words when they said that the company was uh, a good company. And they said, basically, if the bank hadn't have said that, they wouldn't have gone ahead with this deal. And therefore, it was because of what the bank said that ended up causing the loss of money for them. Even though they gained £83,000, they also lost 17000 Now, the bank said there was actually no duty that they owed to Hedley Byrne for those statements that they made because Hedley Byrne weren't their client. There was no contractual relationship and they didn't owe them a duty of care. And the bank also had an alternative, like a second argument, basically, that if there was a duty, if they were wrong and they did owe them a duty of care, they were excluded from that because on their letter they'd put without responsibility on the letter. Now, when they went to court, and the court didn't really see it that way, they found that Heller and Partners did actually owe Hedley Byrne a duty of care. And their reasoning for this was that when you ask someone with special skills, like a lawyer or a doctor, or in this case, a bank, and you ask that person to exp- and you ask that person to apply those skills for the assistance of someone else who relies on that skill a duty of care will arise and the court said that it didn't actually matter that it was words like it was in this case it was something written down it wasn't like they manufactured something or it wasn't like they operated on somebody it was words advice so Heller and Partners did actually owe Hedley Byrne a duty of a care, meaning when they give advice to people or give statements saying something, they should know that someone will rely on that and that's reasonably foreseeable. And if they relied on that and that was incorrect, then someone else could suffer a loss. So in this case, Hedley Byrne relied on what they said, that they were good for the money, and they went ahead with their business deal, and in this case, they actually did suffer a loss, and you should be able to work that out or reasonably foresee that if someone asks you that question and you reply in the positive like that. But you know how the bank said if 
they did owe a duty, they were excluded from it because they'd put without responsibility on the letter. Well, the court said that that without responsibility or the exclusion clause, the bank had actually protected themselves from liability. So just those words had actually protected them from the statement that they made. So consequently, the bank didn't have to pay and Headley Byrne had to wear the costs of the loss of £17,000 and also their legal fees. It's a great case because it shows how the law of negligence has expanded over the years from snails in bottles and manufacturers being liable for things to professions being liable for not only the things they say and do but but also for things that they say or put in writing. It also shows how you can exclude the liability with exclusion clauses. But over the years, many of these things have changed and in your state or country, they may have changed. In Australia, it's been replaced with some legislation, but you still have to know the background of the case behind it because the legislation doesn't cover everything. But it's one of those cases when I said how the judge would be turning in his grave. And the reason for that is nowadays, because of this case, because of Headley Burn, nowadays when you go to your accountant and he gives some advice or your solicitor or lawyer, whatever you might call them, any sort of professional, even though they might not be operating on you or doing anything physically and they're, they're giving you what words or statements, these are things that come under this expanded law of negligence. So super important if you're in one of those professions that you know those sorts of things and really important basically for anyone dealing with anyone in business nowadays it's just amazing sometimes how these laws expand but in all honesty personally i agree that it should be a thing the correct term for it is negligent misstatement so basically you say something and you were negligent in saying it and i agree that professions should be held to that higher responsibility because otherwise people might just give out information willy-nilly and not really think about the consequences so it's an important way of making sure that people really think these things through but I can see it from the other point of view it's it's something that's ended up costing professions a lot of money because they have to get a lot of insurance and especially in Australia our insurance carriers often won't uh, cover the amount that you might need like if you deal with a lot of clients that are dealing with a huge amount of money often we in Australia because our insurers aren't able to cover that much risk we often have to get insurance from the US as well to cover that risk and that can work out very very expensive and in the end, all of that insurance is passed on to the actual client in one way or another because your fees are higher and things like that. So, I mean, I certainly don't have to tell that to our friends across the pond because insurance in America is extremely high as compared to Australia. But, you know, in certain circumstances, our insurance can be really high. And these sorts of things are all passed on to professions. They're all a requirement in Australia for professionals to have this type of insurance. And of course, you know, it all costs and it ends up being the client that ultimately pays for these things in higher fees, which is just the way of insurance, I guess. But yeah, I'm interested as always to know what you think. And I think I forgot to ask how your day and week has been going. It's a very self-centered and roundabout conversation with me today. I'm sorry for that. I seem to be very distracted. <laughs> maybe I'm busy thinking about this chicken and pasta soup I'm about to make. I don't know. Or maybe it's actually the blueberry cheesecake that's really got my motor running 
But I'd be interested to know what you think about uh, the Headley, Headley Burn and Heller case. It is a pretty famous case. Uh, and I'm sorry if you can hear Buddy in the background running around. I think he's indicating that he would like to go for a walk. I'm not too sure if we'll be taking him tonight. He should be exhausted after his current walk. But I'd be interested to know if you think that professionals be held to this higher standard and should owe people this particular duty. And also whether you think that Heller should or shouldn't have uh, got away with the uh, without the responsibility clause. Personally, I think the judge got it right. <laughs> You know, I'm always happy to hear what other people think. You know, I don't always agree with judges. <laughs> I'd be always interested to hear what you guys think and um, what you think of the story. Well, I think I am definitely going to have to take Buddy for a walk because he is causing quite the ruckus here in the background and he has only stopped uh, running around and... and uh, disrupting this video when I've uh, patted him so I can't color and pat at the same time so <laughs> I'm going to have to take him for a walk because he is absolutely demanding it. I am going to come back next time with a crime story next time and also I'm going to come back and do the rest of this picture. Some of it I will do off camera as is my way because I am so slow. No one wants to sit and watch me colour one flower for two hours, you know, seriously. Um, so I will be coming back to finish the rest of this picture and I will endeavour to write down the pencils that I used uh, for this picture below the description and I think I managed it last time for the first video and I will try and uh, do that because people have commented that they would like to know what the pencils were. Did write them on a sticky note so I hope you can see that sticky note and I will try and write them down below the video as well. So that's it from me. I hope you guys have had a good weekend and until next time stay safe and happy colouring.